Thank you very much, Monica. First of all, Dr. Rajan, it's just a privilege to have you here. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, in the audience, we have about 60 minutes with Dr. Rajan, and also we will have Q&A at the end. So hold your questions and keep them concise, and we'll try to take them as, as many questions as possible. Uh, Dr. Rajan, to introduce our audience to you, um, there are bankers in the room, there are people who run payment services companies, but everybody has got something to do with the cross-border flow of goods and services. So they either help individuals like you and me to send money back home, or they help companies who trade and work with their buyers and receive buyers or sellers to move money across the world. And um, they're here because, like Ripple, they want to challenge the status quo. They want to be part of when the new reality unfolds. And lastly, the big reason they are here is because they are lots of fans of yours. Right? And that goes without saying because I spoke to a number of them. Right? So let's start with the first question. Um, in 2005, um, you spoke to a group of eminent economists and actually talking about how the world has become a riskier place because of the financial developments. In 2010, you wrote the book Fault Lines where you talk about um, fractures that are actually threatening the global economy. Have those fractures healed? Are we at a place which is a safe place, or there are new fractures that have developed? Can you help unpack the world for us? Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you very much, first, for having me here. It's, it's such a pleasure to be with this audience, and, uh, of course, uh, with Ripple, and uh, to see what you have uh, accomplished so far. Um, the world changes, right? The world today is not what it was 10 years ago, and the pace of change, of course, is incredible. Um, but there are, of course, challenges we have. One of the biggest challenges is that we don't seem to be growing fast enough for what, uh, uh, what people want. Um, and uh, every attempt we've uh, made to grow faster has, uh, in fact, not worked out. Uh, and this is especially a problem in the industrial world, where after 10 years of very, very easy money, we still seem to be stuck at a moderate pace of growth. And any uh, uncertainties, for example, the recent uh, trade conflict, tends to depress growth substantially. So a lot of talk about recession recently. Um, so what's, what's on the cards for the next, next few years? Well, for one, uh, I think uh, this, um, this uh, easy money will probably continue for the foreseeable future. Central banks are basically on hold because they tried to withdraw the easy money last year by starting to raise interest rates and found that the global economy simply couldn't sustain it. So they backed off. Now, the, one of the reasons the global economy couldn't sustain it is there was a parallel uh, sort of dispute over trade, which uh, took off uh, of an, uh, a certain amount of growth. Uh, today, what we're seeing is that uh, central banks are back on hold. There is some hope that the trade disputes will uh, get lessened. I won't say solved, because it takes a lot to solve what has been uh, the, the, the kind of problems that have been created. Uh, but given that, uh, the chances of a recession over the next year have come down substantially. Um, so, should we worry? Well, the three reasons for worrying. Um, Short-term reasons. We'll come to long-term reasons in a second. Short-term reasons for worrying is, uh, first, there are many strong leaders around the world. And strong leaders have sharp elbows. And they get into disputes, and we've seen that on trade. One of the concerns is, even though there seems to be an, uh, a, a toning down of the temperature on trade, we still don't have a phase one agreement between China and the United States, and things could still break down, given the strong personalities involved. And Twitter diplomacy is involved. And Twitter diplomacy, or lack of diplomacy involved, right? Uh, so that's, that's one uh, big concern. The second is, the world is also a more dangerous place as a result partly as a result of the United States backing off from being the world's policeman, there are lots of dangerous places which are unpoliced. One place which uh, particularly looms large, has loomed large for the last 50 years, is the Middle East. 
And what we saw recently was attacks on the Saudi Arabian oil fields. And uh, those attacks uh, weren't in any sort of obvious way. Uh, there was no um, penalty for the attackers. And that changes the environment there uh, if, as is uh, argued, it was Iran or its proxies which did that, well, they're still out there. Um, we could survive this set of attacks because there's spare Saudi capacity which came online, the spare capacity around the world. What if there's another set of attacks and the price of oil starts, uh, starts going uh, through the roof? So that is another concern that, uh, that, uh, that is there. But the third is, and this goes back to the last point about fault lines, that easy money breeds a whole lot of debt and a whole lot of potential risk. And more easy money means we don't necessarily see a recession, but when that recession happens, the leveraging that has happened, the risk taking that has happened, will come to bear at that point. So the risk of a recession has come down. When it happens, it's going to be more severe because of this very long period of easy money. Got it. Thank you very much for that. Everywhere, everyone here in this room is also hungry for growth. Right? Are there bright spots that you see? Are there opportunities that you see at the macroeconomic level that everybody should focus on, not only to drive growth, but also balance some of the risks that we may not have any control over? Well, I think uh, there are a number of spots which, which one can hope that you see growth. For sure, in industrial countries, we've had tremendous technological change but it hasn't yet shown up in higher productivity. And even somebody who's as pessimistic about productivity as Robert Gordon, who's the uh, world expert on that, believes that we're due for stronger productivity. And, and the reality about technology is that the technolo technological innovations don't translate into actual productivity growth for a time until corporations, uh, businesses learn to use that technology, not in the same old way, not as hacks on the old system, but reinvent the system to use the technology in a way that, that benefits, right? And my sense is the technologies we've had uh, have been here for, uh, for a large amount of time. You should now see them emerging and actually changing the way businesses uh, operate, and we will reap the efficiencies as a result. You seeing it in uh, specific firms within industries, we have these superstar firms which are far more efficient than the average firm, but for it to spread both within the industry across all firms, but also across industries to industries that haven't been touched by the technological change, my sense, I'm a techno-optimist, is that benefit is still to come, we may still see the pace of growth increase considerably and stronger growth rather than the tepid growth that we see today. So productivity is one important reason. The second, I, I think, important possibility is areas of the world that have been excluded so far from the growth process may start joining. Of course, the, the clear case here is Africa, where there are bright spots, uh, Africa as a whole needs to be unpacked. You need to look at specific countries which are doing well, which have hold promise. Africa's young, and it holds promise for the future, even as the rest of the world is aging. Another place which is, of course, very young is South Asia. Now, these are places that are still very poor and haven't benefited from, the, from global growth uh, to the extent that other areas have. But they're also, in that sense, low-hanging fruit. Um, the estimate is that India will overtake, if it ramps up its growth back to where it was a couple of years ago, will overtake the United States in its contribution to global growth in the next couple of years. So in that sense, you know, you have two important spots for growth, China, India, and the United States will then come third. So there are opportunities, I mean, even with this trade conflict, much as it is detrimental to the world, a country like Vietnam is benefiting because people are seeing it as an alternative to China, as a place to do business. So, so you know, there's opportunity even in adversity. 
Fantastic. Um, I want to draw on some lessons when you were the governor of RBI. You took over at a time when it was a difficult time for India. The economic sentiment was down, the currency was tanking, and there were a lot of chaos in the government. And you delivered on the agenda of growth, uh, you and your team together. What is your message to central banks around the world? One, and, and everybody is struggling with growth. And then second, are there some alternative ideas, alternative thinking, which the central banks should pursue, which they are not pursuing today? Well, so let me start first with monetary policy, which is the bread and butter of central banks. Uh, and uh, for a long time, central bankers have been saying they're the only game in town. And I think that's a little bit of a mistake, because when you say you're the only game in town, there's a high risk that you become the only game in town. Uh, growth is not uh, the primary sort of contribution of central banks. It, uh, uh, they typically want to keep uh, inflation low, maintain price stability. Um, growth comes as a result of everybody else doing the right things. And by saying you're the, the only game in town, everybody is looking to the central bank for growth. In fact, you see in the recent relationship between uh, President Trump and the Fed that uh, it may even create uh, misunderstanding where President Trump believes the Fed is holding back on growth and thereby take certain actions which essentially force, are trying to force the central bank to cut interest rates and keep growth up. And uh, it may end up in a situation where the, the administration believes the central bank can do far more than it actually can. And the net result is we have a recession rather than actual growth. So at some level, the central banks have to say, thus far and no more. We've done what we could. We really don't have many bullets left in, uh, in, in the gun. And whatever we have, we have to conserve for really bad times. Um, so what can they do at that point? And at that point, if you're a developing country central bank, what you have is the ability to enhance development. And that was something that we could do in India because uh, you know, just the issue of financial inclusion. Can we bring more of the people who are excluded into the financial system? And there, I would say that, um, you know, for a long time, it, I, I believe we had the priorities on financial inclusion wrong. Uh, we started financial inclusion by trying to push credit. So the whole, um, uh, you know, Grameen Bank idea that you have these uh, uh, small uh, amounts of credit given to people, that's the way to get them in. And there was this myth that everyone would become a micro-entrepreneur. I would argue that many uh, sort of poor people need to first have the experience of dealing with money and learning how to deal with it in an effective way, managing accounts and so on. And that means starting with payments, starting with savings, starting with stuff that doesn't expose them to big risk, uh, which credit does. And it seems to me then rolling them into credit once they have a good sense of how to handle money uh, seems the right sequence rather than starting with credit first. So, so as a central bank, we could try and get them included in the system. Uh, there was a big push by the government to open bank accounts for everyone. But then, once they had bank accounts, you could try and make payments uh, to and fro. Many of these people lived on top of a hill, which was 10 miles from the nearest ATM. How do you get them to be able to make payments easily, uh, sitting at that distance? Well, they had mobile phones. So how do you get mobile payments uh, facilitated? And you were part of the organization, NPCI, which pushed for that. And now we have uh, a, a flourishing payment ecosystem which has taken off. So uh, the, the broader point is growth can be generated through many uh, other ways, especially in a developing country, uh, through financial development, for example. But you have to be careful of doing it in the right sequence. Yeah, fantastic. So what I'm also hearing is, um, and both in the earlier answer and this answer, that technology is a big lever that central banks have, communities have, to then to be able to use that. And this could be companies in terms of raising productivity, or this could be central banks in terms of deploying new business models, to, and it could be for the purpose of profitability in the case of companies, and in case of central banks, it could be for growth. Technology is a big lever. Uh, drawing upon your, again, experience in India, could you give a couple of specific examples? I know UPI, you hinted just at the very top, some of the things that you did 
by using technology as a lever to actually be able to del deliver growth and to be able to make that happen? Well, technology is, uh, uh, you know, I institutions sit on top of technology. And then uh, the question is how to get those institutions to reach out. Uh, there are many ways that, uh, that technology can play a part. One of the biggest ways it helps the process of inclusion, as many of you know, is by reducing the transaction costs. Of, of doing business. One of the big problems in inclusion is reaching the small guy is really costly because you know every transaction costs quite a bit and if the size of the transaction is small it becomes prohibitively expensive given the size of the transaction. So one of the big things that uh, you have to focus on is essentially how do you get the institutions to have the incentive to reach out to these guys and to see a business in there. Uh, one example where we had to make a, a, a big change was uh, we had the uh, telecom companies that uh, controlled access, uh, controlled the technology which allowed access to a huge number of people. And we had the banks which controlled the products. And the two just didn't want to talk. Uh, there was, each one wanted to maintain control over their clients, so they didn't want to do business together. And one of the ways we tried to get them to start talking was by allowing the telecoms into the banking business in a con constrained way. Uh, we call them payment banks. But once we gave them that pathway and the banks realized that the telecoms would actually eat their lunch if they weren't careful, they s had the incentive to start talking. And then a bunch of joint ventures actually emerged. And the, the broader point here is that sometimes uh, the way to disrupt is to make those who are trying to keep out the competition essentially lose their tools, uh, bring in new institutions in the system. Uh, amongst the institutions, so we had a whole lot of staid conservative institutions. One of the institutions we gave a license to is Paytm which was an aggressive uh, marketer of payment services, and we knew uh, this was a disruptive force. Uh, as a central bank, you want to be conservative, you don't like too much disruption, but you know, occasionally uh, you, know, you let the cat among the pigeons and the pigeons actually <laughs> do something. Uh, so Paytm was, was an attempt to get uh, you know, some, some disruption, technological disruption, and it's had uh, a very beneficial effect. Um, of course, there were lots of interesting products that we wanted to enable. One of the things we did was an exchange where small businesses could sell their receivables on large firms. Now, it's starting to take off, but this is clearly a place where technology could re reduce transaction costs immensely and thereby enable a transformation because those small businesses were essentially providing working capital funding to large firms. That seems a travesty. Why should a small firm which had a high, has a high cost of capital fund the large firm? And the easy way to disrupt this is for the large firm to accept it it still gets the working capital funding, but now when that receivable is sold on the exchange, it's a large firm's credit, which becomes the source of, um, of financing, and you get interest rates commensurate with that. Everybody benefits by this unpacking, but the key was you need to reduce transaction costs for this to happen. I think there's more that can be done in this, uh, the use of blockchain technology, for example, to reduce the costs here, and uh, that would create a very vibrant new product which, uh, which could help uh, small businesses access finance easily. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the fundamental things that blockchain solves for is trust. And if you look at invoice discounting platforms like that, where trust could be guaranteed, in that case, it's become much easier both for the buyer and seller to come and then buy that invoice at a discount rate, which, is, which reduces the cost of credit for everyone. It, it is, that's right. It is interesting. I mean, if you think at a fairly abstract level, um, what we're seeing in the world today is an increasing fear and distrust of centralized solutions. I mean, if you think about what the cry in Brexit is, it is take back control from the centralized European structures. Um, across the world, I mean, if you look at the breakdown in globalization that we're seeing, it's, it's a worry about being subject to rules set elsewhere. 
So there is a backing off from centralization, uh, and uh, how do you yet maintain the kind of cross-border transactions, uh, the trade that we need, uh, the f financial transactions that we need in a world where centralization is, is feared? A and I think the answer is more decentralized structures that people trust. Uh, and that's, that's one, way, uh, one place where at an abstract level, something like a blockchain technology, uh, decentralized ledgers, uh, may carry the ability to, to bridge the gaps uh, when uh, centralization sort of breaks down. So uh, I, I think that's uh, part of why you see so many people interested here. Uh, it's also, uh, you know, increasingly, and, and uh, we talked about, my, uh, about inclusion, but increasingly uh, micropayments are going to be very important. Uh, we talked earlier uh, in private about uh, paying for news if you wanted to read an article. Uh, that's a mi micropayment. But as we talk about data, and there, there is a concern that individuals are parting with their data, uh, for nothing, uh, we're going to get information intermediaries who are going to negotiate uh, payments for data, for individual data, with, uh, with firms. That'll be a good thing because if data belong to the individual and can be negotiated, then data doesn't become a source of monopoly power, but can be uh, competitively acquired by new entrants who say, I want the data to run my my, my um, programs on to improve them, how do I get access to a large amount of data? Well, I go to the intermediary and buy the data, but that requires a whole lot of micropayments, and, and, and you can have that happen. So, so in that sense, I think decentralization, becoming smaller, dealing with really small payments, all that is where technology can help and can first allow power to be more dispersed, uh, trust to be dispersed, but also allow uh, a breakup of um, you know, some of the monopolies that we worry about increasingly in this world. And I agree with you. And some of the trends we are seeing today, so for example, one of the big trends that we see in the world is gig economy. So Dr. Rajan could essentially say, hey, Naveen, can you make a presentation for me? And for $50, I could prepare that presentation to you and then you hire me on an hourly basis. Um, in your book, you have also talked about virtual communities. Now, those communities today they can interact with, have a very rich interaction with each other on the internet, but when they want to exchange goods or services for money, that's where it becomes a big problem because in the first case that I alluded to, if you indeed needed to send me 50 US dollars, it will cost you far more to transfer that $50 from US to India for me. So in your view, where would the solution come from? Would it come from policymakers getting together in a room and not to be let out till this gets sorted? Or it will come from the private sector or a combination thereof? What's your view? How can we drive towards a world where this problem can be solved and truly uh, some of these uh, ec economic activity can be unleashed? Well, it comes from all sides, right? Uh, 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 you first have to have the idea, the vision of what is possible, and policymakers are not going to have that. Uh, that's going to come from the private sector. Here are the problems that we, we're trying to solve, and here's a solution. Uh, at which point, when you acquaint the policymakers with what, what possibilities they are, then they start putting their risk uh, metrics on it. W am I comfortable? What are the things that can go wrong? Uh, what's the kind of fraud that can happen, etc., etc.? And then you go back and forth, and then you get something that sort of works. Now, sometimes, uh, you know, the private sector operates in the background uh, at a small level before it comes to the notice of policymakers. So you iron out the bugs, many of the bugs early on, so that there is a solution which is, which is largely tried and tested before it comes to the policymakers. Um, and of course, now we have a whole lot of eager policymakers who understand the value of technology and are willing to sort of cooperate uh, through some of these sandboxes. Uh, okay, you guys want to try this out. Uh, you need some relaxations on technology, uh, on, on the regulations to be able to try it out. And when, in fact, it becomes a viable solution, uh, we will put back some of the regulations. 
but let's not kill this upfront by requiring you to meet every regulatory box there is. So we give you six months to experiment. If it goes well, then we figure out what else needs to be done. And I'm all for when it's small, regulators shouldn't worry too much. They should create these sandboxes and even let them run. Uh, you know, at some point, uh, you have to understand what this is uh, very well because as it gets big, it becomes systemic and could become a real problem. So uh, I, I think the kinds of solutions, you talked about gig economy. Well, gig increasingly, uh, you will have trade in services across the world. The example you gave, or you know, my friend wanted a logo for his company, he sends a request for proposals across the world, somebody in Taiwan sort of creates the logo for him, and that's the transaction. Well, that transaction needs to be compensated, and that's where the cross-border transfer of funds comes in, and you need a reliable way to do that. So I would think we're just at the beginning of a, another wave of globalization. But this wave may be less centralized, less uh, rules of the game up there, and much more decentralized. Uh, and, you know, regulators will still need to be comfortable, but the decentralized aspect of it is also important because trust in global institutions is breaking down. Fantastic. And I think in some way, I couldn't have explained blockchain and the inherent value of the blockchain uh, better than what you just did. Uh, so in terms of just moving to some of the things that we've heard about and Brad alluded to, um, central bank issued digital currency. Um, I know um, China is looking at it and maybe some of the other central banks have looked at it as well or they're actively looking at it, uh, particularly at the retail level. You have been a governor yourself. What, what would it bring to the table uh, in terms of if there was a central bank issued digital currency and are there inherent risks in that uh, that, that uh, people should be aware of as they hear some of these things rolled out? Well, first, um, there are uh, one of the confusion that uh, occurs when we say central bank issued digital currency is people have different uh, things in mind. So first, there is already central bank issued digital currency. It's called reserves. And those are transactable. They're sort of, uh, they move around. Uh, they're bought and sold. Uh, they're, uh, they're there. But they're largely useful for wholesale payments. Uh, now, what people have in mind, uh, the two uh, developments on the retail side, one is a central bank account for retail investors. That is, everybody would have a deposit account in the central bank and you would make payments from that account uh, to anybody else. Uh, that's one possibility, which is made possible by uh, uh, you know, automation, uh, transaction costs have come down. Uh, what this, however, will mean is the central bank maintains all these accounts and knows who's doing what. So issues of data privacy, the centralization, uh, all that comes in, and it also means that the central bank now does the AML CFT, the uh, know, the, know your customer, all of which central banks want to resist doing because they're not in that business. But central bank accounts have one big danger. For the, bank, uh, for the banking system, which is that if the central banks are seen as uh, you know, effective providers of the service, bank deposits become much less uh, uh, sort of attractive from the public's perspective, especially in times of distress. And you can imagine a flight to, uh, to safety from bank deposits to central bank money, uh, and uh, that would essentially create bank runs, which, uh, which would be very problematic. So regulators are a little wary of going towards opening central bank accounts for everyone, uh, both because of the hassle cost of trying to do the, uh, the investigation customer by customer, but also the fear that uh, you may undercut the banks. And if, in fact, bank deposits are a good way of financing the bank, then a central bank who takes in deposits has to find a way to get the money out back to the banks for them to be able to lend, and that's going to be hugely problematic. So let's not enter that business. Where I think there's more traction in central bank digital currencies is in tokenization. So we have currency today. Why not create an electronic token? And that's where some of the technologies that you use will come into play. 
It will be a more anonymous uh, currency, just like your physical currency, but it will be transmittable uh, much more easily uh, across distances than your physical currency. So in other words, it is essentially a way of, uh, of creating um, the possibility of, uh, of all, the, all the funky stuff that you do with digital currencies, uh, with, with cryptocurrencies uh, in the central bank. Two advantages it'll have, it'll maintain value, uh, and uh, um, um, it, it, it is something which is, which is reliable. It is, uh, um, you know, you have the full faith and trust of the central bank associated with it. What it won't be able to do is cross-border transactions, uh, and uh, one of the worries, of course, that central banks have is, uh, is uh, all the security risks associated with something like this. Can it be counterfeited? Uh, what happens if there's a hack, this, that, etc.? So they're going slowly into this. They simply are not that comfortable with this right now, but it is something that could happen down the line, which is why uh, I would argue that uh, within border cryptocurrencies uh, need to find a, a raison uh, d'etre when central banks do this. Got it. Thank you very much for that. Shifting gears a little bit, um, Libra, and I know it's just still a white paper and we know a little bit more from Mark's testimony uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, what's your view on Libra and both just as we now as an, an academician, but also earlier, let's assume this proposal was to come to you as a, as a uh, RBI governor, how would you look at it? How would you react to it? Well, I I the idea is for a fully backed um, uh, coin, right? So you put in uh, a dollar into Libra and it stays as a dollar somewhere and in, in, in turn, I'm issued a Libra uh, uh, or whatever fraction of a Libra that I have. Um, what this can uh, do uh, is, if it has a trustworthy organization behind it, which is also well-regulated because central banks will want to regulate it now that there is a fixed uh, backing. They want to know that the backing is actually there. Uh, what it can do is uh, certainly facilitate within border and cross border payments uh, very easily um, the from the central bank's perspective uh, uh, reserve country central bank's perspective uh, the worry will be one is the reserve being maintained uh, where is it being maintained who has access to it and can it disappear overnight or will it be there all the time? So that's, that's the standard safety and soundness uh, concern because you don't want to run on the Libra without backing. If it's fully backed, then it's okay. Uh, uh, and that's why you want to ensure that the backing is, is absolutely there. But the other concern is if this becomes a big source of payments, uh, what's being done with the information? Uh, is there a monopoly sort of uh, um, acquisition of payment information and how does that affect the rest of the financial system but also is this monopolization a good thing? So uh, one of the things uh, I think not just bank regulators but, uh, but government regulators would want to know is uh, first is the information being uh, sort of kept safe and sound? What are the privacy issues? But second, uh, who has access to it and who can act upon it? And if it is a monopoly, how do we prevent that from being uh, an extortionary monopoly? On the uh, side of non-reserve currencies, there is a very, very big fear that something like Libra could displace the domestic currency and could be a form of dollarization, right? that already the dollar, there are a number of Latin American uh, economies which don't have their own currency. Uh, Zimbabwe doesn't have its, uh, an effective currency, but, but even uh, countries that don't have that level of hyperinflation don't have their own currency because they've been displaced by the dollar. Could the Libra displace it? So there will be a number of countries which may actually say, well, I really worry about this. And uh, because it's trusted, that's the problem, it's trusted more than my own currency. And I don't want people to transact in this outside money um, because my fiat money and all the benefits that come from it, including my ability to erode it, the, the inflation tax that I can impose on people goes away. 
So my suspicion is that um, uh, the regulators across the world will have concerns about one, safety and soundness. And I think the kind of uh, sort of experience with Facebook so far means that it has to actually go up two levels in order to assure people that the safety and soundness will be maintained. But also the issue of information and uh, privacy as well as who has access to that information and is it a monopoly access. Uh, those will be issues that central bankers uh, in reserve currencies will worry about. Central bankers in uh, smaller countries, developing countries, will worry a lot about whether their own currency will get displaced and there may be uh, attempts to restrict the use of this currency. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, what I want to do is, I know we still have time at hand. Pause here. I have a couple of questions, but what I want to do is actually open the floor for us to take some question for the audience and uh, then I can come to some of the summary questions that we wanted to ask you. So if we could bring the light up a little bit um, in the hall and I know that there are people on both the sides who have uh, Wi-Fi mics. So if anybody would want to ask a question, if you could raise your hand and when you do ask a question, if you could just identify yourself and then ask, then that will be great. So, any questions? I can see some hands going up. Yeah, there is a hand there. Good morning, sir. I'm from Sri Lanka, and I did my <coughs> degree in Bangalore. And when I was studying globalization, I felt that the world will be borderless one day. It proved 10 years ago when I got the job in the biggest bank in the Middle East in Qatar. But now, I feel it has taken a reverse gear. With the elections that have been, been seen in the recent past, especially the US and Europe, Brexit, whilst the technology companies are trying to break the border, the governments are becoming more conservative. How do you think and how do you feel the future is going to be for my kids? Great question. Uh, I would hope uh, this de trend towards deglobalization is something that is temporary. And, and uh, what I would argue is that this fear of globalization is one, a misplaced fear, because the fear is really one of technology. And uh, the blame is placed on globalization. And globalization, of course, benefits from technology. But uh, you can't stop the flow of technology, you have to adapt to it. Let, let me explain why I say that. Where is the anti-globalization move now the strongest? And you see in industrial country after industrial country, it is from those who have uh, sort of fears about their future, the fear that they will not be able to adapt, they will not be able to cope. Uh, in a number of industrial countries, you find the small towns where the largest employer has left town because they closed down because of competition from China or Mexico. And as a result, that town has relatively few jobs. Uh, because there are few jobs, uh, you know, uh, a lot of social uh, illnesses start creeping in. Uh, marriage rates fall, divorce rates pick up, um, the uh, level of uh, drug abuse increases, crime picks up. And as a result, the institutions in that locality also start deteriorating. The schools are no longer as good. The community colleges are no longer as good. There's not enough funding to support any of these at the level they should be supported. So people don't have an ability to change now, uh, to adapt, to get those skills that would, that would be required to get those good jobs that, in fact, are out there that technology is creating. So. Um, First, globalization enabled by technology is hitting them. And as a result, they see their enemy as globalization. But in fact, even as globalization is hitting them, technological change is perhaps the much bigger source of job losses. That again and again you see for every four jobs that are lost, uh, every one job that's lost due to uh, you know, trade, four jobs are lost due to automation. And so these people will not actually get their jobs back simply by closing borders, 
because technology will leap across borders and render them again unemployable unless they get the skills that they need. But of course, they're one, one of their cries is, how do I get those skills? Because I don't have the right institutions in my locality. And worse, my kids don't have the right schools to go to because everything is deteriorating. So again and again, I uh, have been saying that the uh, way to prevent a total deglobalization of the world is actually to start in a very unlikely place, to start by reforming our communities which are falling behind, to help them develop, to help them create those institutions that can help their workers get the skills they need for the global economy. So uh, I would argue that much more focus on the places falling behind in the industrial countries would change the mood towards globalization and make people more receptive. Now, if you think about it, the big challenges that we face, other than technological change, are the aging of populations and climate change. And these absolutely require cooperation amongst countries. If you're a rich country, almost surely your population is aging very fast. You have enormous entitlements that need to be supported. Who's going to do the work? It's going to be immigrants from elsewhere who are going to do the work. Who's going to create the demand for your products, for your factories uh, that, well, maybe now have immigrant workers to staff them, but who's going to buy that stuff? Well, it's going to be the rest of the world, the young world which is buying that stuff, which is increasing demand. You just have to see what's happening in Japan in realizing how much, how dependent you become as a country as you age. So aging will require globalization. And similarly, if we are to deal with the problem of climate change, it's not a problem which is dealt with country by country. It is dealt with by the world coming together. Uh, so my point is, to your, to your last point, this is a long answer to a short question, that we have no choice. We have to remain globalized uh, for the sake of your children. And if we are to do that, uh, we have to deal first with the local problems, the internal problems within countries, not by easy money, the, or, but by focusing on how we get these places that are falling behind to develop. And this is a problem not just in the industrial world, it's also a problem that we now see emerging in China, in India. Uh, they each have their pockets of underdevelopment that need to be fixed. Greater equality will create more support for capitalism, and more support for globalization. And this requires hard yards, and that's the reason a lot of time shirking of responsibility. Right. More questions? Yeah. We have a question there. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm uh, Fadi Abdelnur from PayU. We're a large uh, payment aggregator globally, with India being one of our large markets. Uh, one of the frustrations that we've had is, I guess, the stance India has taken uh, towards crypto, and I was just wondering perhaps your view on this policy and perhaps the future if you see any changes to the stance happening in, in the near term. Oh, um, well, I don't want to comment on, uh, on the stance taken uh, by the central bank. I'll give you my personal view uh, of, of crypto, which is it's an interesting technology. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, we have to find the uses for it. And uh, uh, there are a variety of uses that are emerging. Uh, and, and I think until we understand these uses, so long as it's not too big, uh, I'm, you know, happy that we, we, we sort of allow it to, to, uh, to flourish. Um, there are, uh, of course, um, um, sort of supervisory issues, uh, I should say it's um, um, issues of consumer protection, etc., that a regulator would worry about. Are the people who are investing in these cryptos fully aware of the uh, risks and the uh, volatility and so on? A and so long as that is satisfied, I would uh, be happy to allow them to find their niche. Uh, and once they, that, that niche is, uh, is determined, uh, then I would evaluate it as a regulator to see if it, it, it sort of uh, is a valuable product. And that's where I say, so long as small, uh, let it flourish, uh, just making sure that everybody who's in it understands what they're getting into. 
And then as it becomes bigger, think about the regulatory issues and so on. Uh, but uh, presumably as it gets bigger, there's a technological value to it. And uh, we, we sort of weigh, the, uh, weigh one against the other. Yeah. So look at why it has become bigger. Is it delivering the value? It is delivering on the use case. If it is, then right. look at and, how and we And then can the, the regulation has to adapt yeah. to make sure that you enable it while protecting against po potential risks. So that's what, again, you don't want to kill a product early on by over-regulating it. Uh, I think you want to let it find its feet, and therefore, so long as you know, whoever's entering into it is, understands it, uh, that's fine. And, and that's why I think this idea of a sandbox where you negotiate with the regulator and say, you know, here are the people I'm going to target uh, and give me regulatory dispensation on this one is a good way to proceed. And I, I understand India has started this uh, notion of a sandbox, and I would hope that it would move in that direction. Please, go ahead. Uh, Dr. Rajan, my name is Shankar. Uh, first of all, a big fan of yours from your time as, as governor. Um, you, my question really goes back to the Libra conversation. Uh, I'm intrigued by uh, what you mean by regulatory, uh, the regulatory aspect of it. Given that Libra is, let's say, for a second, US, uh, under the US jurisdiction, it's obviously going through a lot more scrutiny. Do you see someone like an Alipay or someone else, maybe from a different jurisdiction, being able to get uh, a similar thought across and become a global currency or coin or whatever you want to call it, which will facilitate, I believe, payments and other things that you mentioned in your Paytm example. I mean, I see this as a Paytm moment for the globe if uh, we are able to ever get that going. What's your thoughts? Yeah, uh, I, 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 it is a little different from the uh, decentralized solutions in that it is promising that the value will be there, right? And as a result, what you want to know is if somebody in uh, uh, Timbuktu has put money into Libra, that in fact, that there is a corresponding uh, amount of value sort of uh, somewhere uh, which uh, somebody from Timbuktu can get access to when they want to get out. So this requires every regulator to feel happy that in fact their citizens are protected. And uh, regulators always worry about worst case scenarios. What happens if there's a run on Libra, okay? So if all the money, all the reserves are in Geneva, uh, in, in Switzerland, well, that's very good for any Swiss uh, person who see, appears to be transacting. But what happens to that guy in Timbuktu? How does he get access to that value if in fact it's sequestered to help people there? Now, you say, well, there's, there's a dollar for everyone, so this is not an issue. Well, the regulator needs to know that it is there for everyone and where it is, right? So those are the kinds of concerns that emerge. Now, uh, you talked about an alternative currency. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, so long as it can inspire trust, uh, it is quite possible that private currencies emerge. Again, I would say the big threat is regulation. And it will come from entities who feel their own monopoly over fiat currency is being questioned uh, or is being, uh, there is competition for that. And so it is easy to imagine some jurisdictions that given that they, uh, the central bank and the government will lose out in this competition, given the private currency is so much more reliable, uh, they may effectively say, no, you can't use it here. Who has the mic? Please go ahead. Yeah. Hi, my name is Bradley Kimes from Investment Perspectives and Cryptonair's documentary. I wanted to ask a question about globalization. If you could talk about the idea of the old concept of the banker coin and a neutral asset being in place of a global reserve status of the dollar and possibly that being XRP. Uh, uh, <laughs> um. You know, uh, what you're asking for is whether there's a possibility of a global currency. And to some extent, that's what Libra was trying to do. And as I understand it, that's different from what 
XRP is trying to do. And, and, and the reason is, is as follows. As soon as you go to maintaining the value, right, some kind of stable coin, uh, a whole set of regulatory concerns get triggered. I have to make sure that there is corresponding uh, financial or real assets backing this, this notional value that, is, that they seek to maintain. That looks a lot more like a bank, right? Because uh, you're promising some, some claims which are fixed and uh, uh, that requires regulation for reasons I just talked about. Now, once you get an army of regulators, every central bank looking at it, then the question is, have you added a whole set of transaction costs to this and is it worth, uh, uh, is it that, that useful? As I understand it, what, uh, what is attempted with XRP is not so much maintaining the value, but offering a vehicle for exchange, which is quite different because there you can have value fluctuating. All you need is value to be stable for 10 seconds while the uh, whole transaction takes place. And as a result, uh, there's a whole different need for regulation. You don't need to regulate value. I don't care. So long as there is some value, the transaction can certainly take place. And as a regulator, I'm not so worried about either this displacing my fiat currency, because you're moving from one fiat currency to another, it's just an interim value. And it's, it's a means of exchange, but it's neither a store of uh, value nor a unit of account, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you very much. I must have said something right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, please, who has the mic? Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Anthony Lim at the back here with Ripple. Uh, Dr. Rajan, to your comments about tokenization of uh, central bank currency, in particular, sorry, in, in particular, if China were to proceed as rumored to issue a tokenized version of the RMB. What are the implications, if any, uh, to its ability to facilitate payments, commercial payments, on an international basis using, using this tokenized version and the implications of its control over domestic money supply in China and all foreign reserves? Well, I, I, you know, at, at its simplest level, I, I would argue it may facilitate domestic transactions, but it's not clear to me it has a big impact on international transactions. At the simplest level, what I would think the way it would operate is I take back a, a note and issue a corresponding digital token and, you know, effectively what that reduces is transaction costs of transmitting that within the country to anybody else. Um, I couldn't do it with a, with, with a, with a cash, uh, with, with a currency note, I can do it with a digital token. Um, would it change anything on the international side? I doubt it. Uh, would it make China more of a reserve currency? I doubt it. Uh, what all that requires is a whole set of, uh, you know, issues associated with reserve currencies, the ability to, to go in and out of the renminbi, not go into the renminbi, but all go in and out, uh, have investable assets in the renminbi and so on, uh, have a very liquid market for financial assets, all of which, to my mind, are somewhat peripheral to the tokenization that, that we talked about. Um, is there any other implication? Um, you know, if, if the world moved to digital tokens, there's a digital dollar, there's a digital renminbi, perhaps at the periphery it may make the, uh, the, the exchange transaction easier, but you may still need an intermediary sort of uh, facilitator uh, of the kind that we've talked about, such as X XRP. So uh, at, at this point, I think it's still early days, but the tokenization itself will just facilitate domestic transactions. I'd be curious if you have other things in mind than that. We have time for a couple of more questions, so let's go ahead. Keith. Yeah. Hi, good morning. I'm Keith Carter with National University of Singapore and director of our FinTech Lab, which we just opened yesterday with a big thanks to Ripple. <laughs> uh, 
A key question you talked about education and communities be needing to be supported and regulators, how can we as universities contribute better to the education and understanding that regulators have around Ripple and other technologies? That's a great, great point because, uh, you know, as a regulator, uh, my, uh, uh, you know, I, I was, uh, let's say, poorly informed uh, at best. And uh, if the main source of information came from industry itself, I would worry about the biases involved. Yeah, of course you're going to tell me this is the perfect solution. Uh, I'd love to have an independent party tell me this works really well. And, and so I think in, uh, in this environment of a tremendous amount of hype, you know, the hype surrounding blockchain, for example, it could do any and everything, right? People started talking about how blockchain would, uh, would change, uh, you know, ev uh, the basis of, uh, of capitalism. And, and you want to be a little careful. Yeah, decentralized ledgers have an important role but in specific areas, that's where they can make a big contribution. And they can certainly change a variety of things. We talked about micropayments of, uh, of a variety of kinds. They can reduce transaction costs. They can uh, sort of propagate trust. All those are great things, but they have specific places. And the hype tends to first put off people because you don't know what's real and what's not. And it makes regulators very suspicious because uh, is this sort of fluff? And I don't want to, want to be associated with fluff. So I think academia can play an important role in uh, separating the fluff from the reality and giving a sense, here's a real value-added solution. And as a result, you should be thinking more about it. This will be our last question. So we are happy to take our last question. Whoever has the mic. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm. Uh, I'm Dennis from uh, iRemit, uh, a global remittance company based in the Philippines. We're a publicly listed uh, company in the Philippine Stock Exchange and we're present in uh, 26 countries. So uh, we met Ripple in uh, Singapore last year with uh, Naveen here. Uh, so in the last five, six years, we've been, uh, our industry has been disrupted by the, the risking of uh, regulators globally. So that, that is the reason why we went with Ripple to look at technologies to bridge the gap. So my question for, uh, for mostly for the regulators also, which uh, where you're a part of is, uh, are these technologies available today would sustain our businesses or the regulators will come in again and uh, you no know, find stricter rules imposed on us. Uh, we've seen the incidents before on old tech with the Philippines, with the Bangladesh Bank. It's a big news. That's why all eyes are in our country. Uh, we, we process, uh, there are 10 million Filipinos outside the country sending $26 billion inwards into the country. So looking at these technologies available right now, will these technologies be sustainable? And, uh, uh, or, or the regulators will, again, uh, think of ways to lock down on us and uh, uh, well, it's, follow it's a vicious a cycle of uh, you know disrupting our industry once again. It's a it's a very good question, and um, I can't speak for all regulators, f uh, but I can try and sort of uh, uh, give you a sense of what's on their minds. Uh, certainly, uh, what's on regulators' minds is we don't quite understand this, and could it be something that could uh, torpedo? everything in a moment's notice. Uh, that's where cyber risk uh, is something that most regulators sort of, uh, uh, basically it gives them sleepless nights because you, it's one of those uh, sort of uh, possibilities that could overnight blow a huge hole in the, in the system. Uh, we've heard of uh, you know, ATMs spew spewing out cash because somebody has figured out how to, how to hack into them. And if that happens across the country, or if somebody wipes out a certain set of um, you know, uh, records, um, you know, uh, um, these are, these are c concerns that regulators have, and cyber j just multiplies the size of the possibilities. So one uh, aspect of any new technology is to assure the regulator 
that the risks are in fact controlled. And obviously you need a regulator who's open to hearing uh, on one side, but you should be able to make the case that you are controlling risks. Uh, uh, one of the things uh, uh, that's, that's therefore important to, uh, to assure regulators is you have the same concern about risk that the regulator has, that you're not this aggressive uh, person who's going to test the margins, but that you understand you're going to play within the rules. So uh, showing yourself as, as a uh, uh, law-abiding rule player, even while being innovative, I think is extremely important. The other uh, sort of source of concern from the regulatory perspective is whether you'll be competition. And uh, that's where I talked about uh, Libra for some of these smaller central banks, that this could be competition for some of their main services. And of course, central bankers are human. Uh, they don't like competition, and they would want to snuff it out if, uh, if they really fear it. So uh, one is, can you assure them that the risks are in fact contained? You, are, uh, you have the same sort of incentives as they have. And that's a process of educating them, but also as a process of building trust with them. Uh, I think that's something that uh, you know, somebody like Ripple works on. And, and the other side is to assure them that you're adding on to what they're trying to do rather than displacing them. Uh, th in the best of worlds, that would not be necessary. In the world we live in, that's probably important. Dr. Rajan, this was absolutely brilliant for me. I learned a lot, and I can see that on the faces of every single audience. So at this point, I really want to thank you for making time for us for such an interactive session and very openly sharing your views and uh, bringing us into the fold. So thank you very much. And at some point, we would like to love to have you again. Thank you.